My name is Ulrich Schechtle. I will talk today about Inference QL, which is our new platform for automated inference for programmer and data analyst. Um, the Inference QL platform is a software project done in a research lab, which unlike software projects in many other research labs will persist over years and is thus quite some team effort, a bunch of people contributing. Uh, Vikash, who is the principal investigator in the group, who should be, should be here today on, at Strange Loop. Zane, the software engineering lead is in the front, also here. Uh, talk to me or them. Um, Harish Tella is doing our UX um, for us. Saad, done a lot of the research behind the theory behind this. And uh, Nick is a new master student who contributes. And Sara uh, helps with civic use cases for the Inference QL platform. So what we want to do with Inference QL is empowering programmers and data analysts to do probabilistic inference. And we hope that Inference QL helps them to do this with a SQL-like query language and some automated inference engine um, based on probabilistic programming and the probabilistic programming par paradigm. I will talk a little bit about the background of um, automated data modeling and probabilistic programming. I will give two tutorials, including live demos on uh, uh, real-world data. I will talk a little bit about the limitations of the existing inference scale prototype and our current research. And I will show a real-world application, one of the real-world applications that we have in our lab um, uh, of inference QL. What is probabilistic inference? Um, Probabilistic inference allows you to answer questions with models, oftentimes models about data. Um, and examples for such questions are, given a data set of rental listings that contains errors, what are cleaned records most likely uh, to be? Or given data from a wet lab experiment in biology, for example, what is the probability that modifying a certain gene won't influence any other genes and thus have downstream effects that uh, uh, we want to avoid. Given data about cluster job runtime, maybe you want to ask whether uh, a certain job on that cluster is likely to succeed and how much cost will occur uh, before doing so. Now, data and data science is a hard subject. And the graphic here that was conceived by, by Andrew Silver and Drew Conway um, there are three axes, and the three axes are related to three domains and uh, uh, typical backgrounds of the people who try to use their data. One axis is intuition. If you're a domain expert and you look at data from your domain, you have an intuition about what you want to find or what you should find in the data. The other axis is automation. If you have some coding skills, um, then you can produce data pipelines that reproducibly uh, produce the same results over and over again um, that can be used by other people and um, uh, that are basically sustainable. Um, if you have statistics experience, experience, then you know whether any conclusions you draw from your data are supposed to be valid. And if you look at this Venn diagram, there are a number of danger zones. Um, if you know how to hack and you have knowledge about multivariate statistics, um, then oftentimes you don't have domain knowledge because the two, learning the two probably takes on an entire career. If you know about the domain and you know about coding, you are likely to write traditional software. And if you don't know how to write software but understand statistics and domain expertise, you're in trouble when more complex methods are needed that require more complicated pipelines. The consequence of this is that decision makers oftentimes don't trust uh, results based on data analysis. Um, uh, there, I put here on the slide this famous quote by Churchill that he only um, believes statistics that he doctored himself. But also consultancies um, recently uh, put out some studies that suggested that over half, uh, for example, of C-suite respondents admit to discounting data analysis they don't understand. And that makes sense if you look back at the Venn diagram that we see. There's plenty of reasons why 
uh, a decision maker shouldn't believe their data. What is the solution? So Andrew Gelman, famous statistician from Columbia, um, argues that statistics is hard, um, and we have to accept statistical incompetence not as an aberration, but as a norm. So training more and better statisticians might not actually be the solution. And apparently, according to Glassdoor, it really, which provides another data point, it's really not the solution either. You, um, data scientists in 2017 was the most um, uh, demanded job, um, even before a DevOps engineer. So just training more might not work. But then there's this interesting sort of like dynamic here where you know, we have five million developers, we have 75,000 uh, uh, folks with stats, grad, grads, uh, stats degrees, and I think around the world roughly 100 million Excel, Excel users um, do empirical inference uh, using Excel. Um, and what we're trying to do with Inference QL is trying to mimic what SQL did for business analytics. So SQL enabled 10 million people to think about their data logically without having to worry how it's implementing on the machine. And if you go back so like to the classic paper uh, by Cott, um, he you know, really sum uh, summarized that up concisely in the first sentence of the paper, and it might be hard to read here, I'll just read it out loud, is he says, Future users of large data banks must be protected having to know how the data is organized in the machine. And what we are thinking about doing with Inference QL is doing the same thing for data analytics and data science. So our aspiration, that's an aspiration, not necessarily a realistic goal, but an aspiration is to enable 10 million people to think probabilistically. And that includes programmers, spreadsheets users, um, statisticians and data scientists, students and executives, and AI research and probabilistic programmers. All of those can use our tools. Probabilistic programmers and analysts can use inference QL to solve inference problems using our um, SQL-like uh, language or our Clojure API. Uh, spreadsheet users um, use inference-based uh, uh, use inference-based data search and filtering to understand what their data really looks like. That use case I have witnessed personally with my bio collaborators, where we were on a call with more than 15 uh, uh, bio collaborators who um, collaboratively sorted columns to try to conclude which experimental setting has which effect. Um, uh, so it's a real use case. And again, students, uh, statisticians, and AI researchers, we try to sort of like, um, cover with inference QL as well. So, as I said, our solution is a SQL-like query language and automated inference based on probabilistic programming. So, what is Inference QL? Inference QL is a query language and an automated inference engine. It uses probabilistic programs written in Clojure via the Metaprop library. Metaprop is developed in-house, the probabilistic programming system. Um, we provide baseline models, automatically generated with the uh, CrossCAD model class and our base DB system, which we are um, slowly deprecating, but we had around for six years in the lab and we're ongoingly developing on it. Um, we, want to, we, we can customize models using R for data scientists via the Graal virtual machine. And inference QL currently cross compiles to roughly 700 KB of JavaScript. Um, we are intending to release it under Apache 2.0. Currently it's in private beta. So what is probabilistic programming? Probabilistic programming is based on two ideas. Uh, one, probabilistic, program, uh, uh, probabilistic models can be represented as code. And two, operations on models can be represented as metaprograms doing something with uh, the programs that implement the probabilistic models. What are these operations? Operations include inference, uh, such as finding probable values for latent variables, learning, as in finding probable parameters and structure, uh, given observed data, and querying, answering what-if questions, uh, ranking data, 
uh, based on how surprising it is and inferring unknown values with calibrated confidence levels. So probabilistic programming builds the backbone of inference QL. But we also provide automated data modeling. Um, and we do this via Bayesian synthesis of probabilistic programs. So the idea here is that we start with a sparse database or data table, um, combine that with uh, qualitative and quantitative constraints if we want, such as if I have a data table and I want to make sure that two columns are not affect each other in the data table or not related, are treated independent according to my model, then we can specify this. We put both into the synthesis engine, and what the synthesis engine spits out is a set of probabilistic programs, an ensemble of probabilistic programs that model the data that we put in. Then we can use a system like InferenceQL to post queries against those uh, um, probabilistic programs that we synthesized. And out we get answers, answers for our questions that we have about our data. So, um, so much for theory, um, but I brought a case study that I will live demo in a second. Um, and the case study is about programmers from uh, the 2017 Stack Overflow survey. Uh, Stack Overflow every year um, makes their users, or asks their users to fill out uh, a bunch of questions, and um, we took a subset of that data and uh, curated it for the demo today. And the idea here is that, again, we have information in the world about Stack Overflow. All we have is those survey answers. Can we get a probabilistic model program? Can we synthesize it automatically? So we can then ask questions about that data. And what this so like probabilistic programming is supposed to do is it's supposed to virtually generate new survey answers based on the data that we learned, based on the models that we learned from the data, that we synthesized from the data. Can we do that automatically? It turns out we can. Um, our old BaseDB platform, um, plus some new extensions, allows us uh, in less than 20 lines of code to synthesize probabilistic programs um, given only a data table. And the only constraints that I put in here, remember earlier I talked about of, uh, qualitative and quantitative constraints, the only constraints I put in here in this model is that certain columns are supposed to be treated as numerical variables and other ones are nominal. nominal. Um, in this example, we only have four columns, a data table four columns, because otherwise I wouldn't have fitted it on the slide. But the um, code and the calls to the base DB language in the BQL uh, query language wouldn't be different. What comes out is a program like this. This is a probabilistic program that is written in Clojure um, and runs with the Metapub library. And if you execute it, uh, what you get is a new row in this four row data table, a uh, four column data table. And it's a probabilistic model, so you can actually write those meta programs, those query programs, to get answer about the data in the table uh, from looking at that model. So those of you who have thought about those problems before might now uh, say, well, there's a technical challenge here. Learning programs about your data is the same as learning structure of a model. And for people tried to do this um, a few years back. Um, for example, in Bayesian network structure learning, and a bunch of problems occurred um, and uh, are not solved for Bayesian network structure learning, basically, uh, today, which is search over structure is slow and unreliable. It's hard to include hidden variables. Um, it's hard to apply to mixed data types. And it's very difficult to combine with accurate quantitative models if you wanted to insert your own domain knowledge in form of a quantitative model. It's difficult to get uncertainty over the model structure. And it's also hard for ordinary users to ask questions. Um, but we have new solutions to this problem. So instead of doing the old structure search, um, we use modern, modern Monte Carlo inference on the cloud um, to get to solutions in reasonable time. Um, we have uh, a non-parametric Bayesian prior and models that allow us to include hidden variables, models that we have researched for years. Um, the mixed data type are expressed 
using our own domain-specific language that um, is part of Inference QL. And um, we can include custom code, and I will uh, live demo that later on. Um, and we can get uncertainty via modern Monte Carlo. And Inference QL allows you to query um, those models via both a spreadsheet interface and a SQL interface. So now to the live demo. So I don't know how readable that is. But what we see here is data from this Stack Overflow survey. So every row in this data table is a uh, software developer or a programmer who answered the survey. And every column is a certain question. For example, did they not, do they know the Bash shell? Do they know about Linux? Do they know Java? Do they know C++? What is their opinion about AI? Um, how many years are they coding professionally? What do they earn? Are they satisfied in their job? And so on. So that's data from the real world that we observed. We can click on uh, those columns to visualize the data. So it might be a little bit hard to read, but if you hover over it, it's better. So if you look, click at the, um, the Linux column, it's like in this subset of the data, 61 of the records imply that the person didn't know, uh, didn't know Linux, and 39 do know Linux. If you go, for example, to the salary uh, column, click on that too, you get a histogram of the numerical salaries. Uh, one note about that histogram, it's um, software developer and programmer salaries worldwide, so there's this interesting distribution. Now, what we've just seen, you know, you could do in Excel. Um, and I told you before that, um, oops, go up, that um, we can do more. Um, and what I will demo now is that because we have an underlying probabilistic program that we learned from this data, we can just execute this program to gain new virtual data, virtual survey answers. Um, based on the model that we learned from the, from the original data. Uh, in order to save me the embarrassment of making you all watch my typos, I will just copy the query. Um, so, our query says, select all from, and now here's a statement that's specific to, to inference QL, from generate everything as an entire row from the underlying model and stop after one new data point has been generated. If I run this query, we see in the bottom table, new data starts to show up. We can run this again every time one new data point shows up. We can change the limit and generate, say, 100 data points over time. So that data is representing what we've learned from the model. So for example, if you click on this Linux column and uh, the, from the real world data and the Linux column from the uh, observed, uh, from, the, from, the, from the virtually generated uh, survey answers, you can tell that um, the distribution aligns, so what we learned seems to be in line with the data that was observed, plus some minor uncertainty. So we see that we can generate multivariate new samples from the model that has been generated given this data. Now, if we wanted to zoom in into a specific region of the thing the model learned, we can tell this by modifying the query. So we can write generate all um, from model. Let me just copy it again so I don't gonna make any silly mistakes. Um, generate all 
given that Java is false, so given that a developer doesn't know Java, what should the other data look like? Let me clear what I generated before and generate, say, 100 data points here. And now we get 100 virtual survey answers um, that, are condition, that, that are conditioned on a developer knowing Java. We can then use this and try to visualize, um, oops, unclick that, sorry. What I meant to show was visualizing uh, uh, the, the conditional distributions, as in the conditionally generated data here from Bash Shell, given that uh, a user knows Java. So we can zoom in on what we learned. And that's a query language, so you can basically ask an infinite amount of questions here. So you could ask here, um, just double check. Um, you could ask you, how about we want to generate data given somebody knows Java and um, they know, say, uh, Linux. Oops, typo. Let me copy. Yeah, I forgot to write Linux equals true. Um, so what we're going to generate is data uh, for developers who don't know Java and, but do know Linux. So all of Java is false and Linux is true. So we basically see, when we click at, for example, this distribution, that's the distribution of somebody knowing Bash Shell given, uh, uh, given that they know uh, 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 Linux, but not Java. So why is this useful? So first of all, we can use this to make statements about missing data. So I showed you how we can generate new data conditioned on other information. So if I now wanted to know like, what user ate here, what's his opinion in AI, even though that person didn't want to fill out the survey, I can click on that and um, get the distribution of simulation, simulated data conditioned on all the other uh, information in that row. Um, so for this particular uh, user, um, we are pretty certain that they are excited about the possibilities and not so worried about the dangers of AI. So you can use this to fill in missing data. Um, you can also use this to check how expected existing data is. So say I clicked on this user here um, who doesn't know C++, um, which is uh, getting this distribution here. The red line is the actual observed value, so he, they don't know C++. Um, and it turns out, yeah, that's what we expect. They shouldn't know C++ given everything else in the data. Um, but how about some, this person here? Uh, well, for them, it turns out, they actually know Linux, but all the other data in the row would suggest that they shouldn't, as in, like, this is the distribution for uh, Linux true and false, and while the person knows Linux, the data suggests that they shouldn't. By the way, the wiggling that you're seeing is because we generate what is called in stats language Monte Carlo samples, as in we create a bunch of those newly generated data to check how expected the observed value is. So this idea of checking how expected observed value is um, uh, is quite interesting in the sense that we can use this to detect unusual data. So Let's do this. Let's, for every single row in our data table, compute the probability of seeing um, 
the observed salary that this person has. Um, but not take into account any other data. See, if you can read the query, I haven't um, included the uh, given statement now. Um, so we only look at the salary uh, column. Let me move the salary column and also delete this in order to not distract. So if I run this query, what I get is a bunch of probabilities um, that only say, okay, not take into account any other information, what, you know, how probable, how expected is uh, a certain salary. And we can visualize this by marking both of them, scrolling down, and you see that it's pretty normal, the salary is pretty normally distributed. Obviously, the, the extreme values in this data set where they earn more than 200,000K, they're not expected. That's cool, but not that great. You could do that with a simple you know, SQL statement as well, just by ordering it. But um, we can also do this again by taking into account all the other information that we have um, about, a, about a user. So what we're now doing is, how ex is, is trying to compute how expected the salary is given every other, if all the other information in every row. So for each row, look at the salary, uh, salary that, that that row has recorded, look at everything else, and check whether it makes sense. Let's run this. You see the probabilities change. Now let's also visualize it again. And suddenly the distribution looks quite funny, not as normal anymore. And it turns out that yes, sort of like the uh, people who have extreme values still are outliers. They are, those are here in the bottom. The x-axis is the salary, by the way, and the y-axis is the probability if people can't read this. Um, however, there's also a person around here who is in the top 10 unlikely uh, unexpected values. And um, but has a reasonable salary, and for other rows, that salary is perfectly fine. There's a bunch of you know, data in this regime, but why, why is this person special? Well, let's look at it. I said before we, we can use InferenceQL to search existing data, and the way we do this is by simply sorting that column. We sort the entire data table according to column, um, and then let's pick out our friend who is it has a sort of like average salary. Oops, where are they? Here. 18. 18, yeah, thank you. So why are they not likely? So it turns out if you look at the survey answers, the person doesn't have any skill. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're not ex they don't care about AI, which in the current day and time apparently is not good. Um, uh, and, I, and the person doesn't have any experience. So all the data that we have would suggest, okay, in this distribution, they should have less. Um, so takeaway messages, you can use this to screen how unexpected a, an observed uh, data, uh, data point is uh, in the context of what the other information is that we have about that person. Now, there's another way how we can search our data. Um, which works similarly, but slightly different. So imagine the following use case. I'm looking for a Java script developer. Um, so somebody who knows JavaScript, I sort the column according to put the true things up first. Um, but I also want them to have you know, like reasonable amount of, like quite a ton of experience, say. So we want somebody who's very experienced, we want them to lead a team. So let's only pick people who have, you know, this person has lots of experience. Uh, who else, 27, great. This person has a lot of experience. Oops, that was, sorry? Oh, thank you. Um, so we provided 
a new column in our data table. Our model wasn't originally trained for that column in terms of machine learning speak. Um, but we can ask the model, what's the probability of the newly supplied label being true given the rest of information that we have? Because we have learned the model about all the other columns, not the new one that we just defined on the fly. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but, and, and then we want to see if we can you know, extrapolate from those four data points uh, onto sort of like other data points, other labels. So what we ask the model to do is generate a, um, a set of predictions for all the other columns. And the first folks who come up all have like reasonable amount of experience and no JavaScript. Now, I only have provided four labeled examples and very little inference. And I have to say at this point, we have invested zero, point, uh, zero uh, time in optimizing the speed of any of this. Um, so like all the parameters are, are tuned down. But that's not a problem. But those wrong examples here, I can just you know, also label them as false and then ask the system to basically improve the prediction. I have 10 minutes of time. I'm probably at half of my talk, which is not that great. So I, will <laughs> um, I think I will move on. Uh, <laughs> great. The other tutorial that I want to talk about is, talk about is one about uh, Earth satellites. And um, uh, the, the data on this example is uh, coming from a, a citizen science project, the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, people who observe satellites in the sky and then collect data about this. Um, here's an example, row in the data table. Um, everything that is red on the right is missing, so this data is heterogeneous, as in there's categorical values, what is the purpose, who's the user, um, there are numerical variables, and so on. And there are a bunch of, oops, hello? Actually, I should go and pre present mode again. Um, there are quite a bunch of questions you can ask about that data. You could draw inferences about new data that's partially observed. You can screen the data for errors, anomalies. You can find similar satellites, quantify predictive value of information. You can fill in the missing values. You can model the p patterns of missingness and so on. Uh, cool. The workflow is the same. We basically start. Uh, with observations of the world, generate a probabilistic program, and have this thing in our live demo. Oops. So the user interface is pretty much the same, only that now our columns are, uh, uh, are this data inputted by, by, by the citizen scientist. What is the purpose? Um, data about sort of like the orbit, perigee, apogee, and period minutes, the type of orbit, and so on. Um, and we can, you know, play the same game again uh, and generate new data from the model that we learned from this data above. So let's generate 30 data points. Um, and check how the data aligns from the simulations, the virtual satellites, and the data that we've seen. And I mean, if you could see, like, yeah, the simulations are, ah, they're not that great. The reason for that is that we only looked at the data. We didn't Im uh, add any information about the model, no domain knowledge whatsoever. But we're not. <laughs> um, we can fix that. Uh, we can right-click on a certain column, say period minutes, a column about which we have information, um, uh, and uh, basically add information about how that column should be generated given other columns. And we do this by adding basically Kepler's loss. And now I pop, when we, what we want to check is, once we add that in, do our predictions improve? So we set this. Uh, we again oops, generate 30 new data points. Let's compare again. Sorry. 
This is the observed data. And that's the newly generated data. So there's a little bit of an improvement, but not much. So we can use this as sort of like a way to evaluate our hypothesis of whether that model improves. OK. I have five minutes, I guess. Um, limitations about our current research. We're, we're trying to find names, how we describe our prototype. Um, and I have to tell you that this is a research prototype. Um, so it's very, very early. It's developed by uh, uh, students and some software engineers. But there's a reason why it's currently beta. Um, we need better support for combining more statistical, symbolic, and neural models. Um, we want to do micro-benchmarking and performance engineering, so uh, the queries run faster. Um, we want add support for testing goodness of fit, and we want quantitative tests uh, for sensitivity and specificity for detecting, excuse me, for detecting multivariate relationships. And we want to increase our query language to add uh, missing like SQL-like functionality, like insert column, which currently doesn't really work. Um, I have one more example application. This is a real-world use case where we use this currently. Um, we work on a DARPA project on synthetic biology, um, where the problem statement is, OK, you look at an organism. You have an experimental setup. Um, you modify the organism. You have a wet lab environment. You want to know what happens inside the organism, but all you get is noisy observations. So all you get is like what they call RNA-seq measurements. So it's unclear what happens inside the organism. If you knew what happened inside the organism, you could run an ordinary analysis of the program, and you would get an idea about the mechanisms and the dependencies that have generated your noisy observations. But again, we don't. So the problem statement, again, is the same. We have a wet lab experiment. The biologists we work with produce tons of data, um, but it's unclear what goes on in, uh, in, in the data. Um, and our approach actually produces accurate simulators for pretty, dicky, tr pretty tricky distributions. Um, what we see here is an example where you have the um, uh, normalized read counts of gene expressions for two genes. And we can see that basically it's highly nonlinear, but our virtual simulations line up really well with the observed data. Uh, I have a very quick live demo that I will just show um, on this. And we can basically, that, that's basically showing uh, what we do and what we supply the biologists for um, uh, in this use case, which is they want to understand what um, gene is quote unquote talkative, as in if you modify a certain gene, will it um, affect other genes? Can they engineer that gene safely or can they not? Because if a gene is quote unquote talkative, um, that means there will be downstream effect. One gene expresses another, expresses another, and you don't know what happens. And the more often that happens, uh, the more likely it is that the cell, that the organism dies because it's unclear what, what happens down the line. Um, so, what the graph shows is a bunch of genes and their predictive relationships. And the key takeaway from this demo is if you change that to just linear correlation, which is best practice in synthetic biology still, um, all of the relations disappear because our data is so nonlinear. Um, and in fact, it turns out that our model in Total variation distance, if you discretize the, 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 uh, the numerical space, is doing way better than both uh, a linear model and the multivariate model. And in fact, if you fit a line just between those two, uh, two, two, two genes, it doesn't really get it. <laughs> um, and the total variation distance reflects that. Uh, OK, the demo apparently was supposed to happen here. I already gave it to you. Um, yeah, collaborations. Uh, our team is growing. The software is mature, maturing. And we are looking for collaborations in automated intelligence. For example, data cleaning um, for, for streams of structured records in industrial settings. Uh, performance modeling is something that is interesting to us. If you want to do data-driven performance modeling, please reach out. Um, and crowdsourced data labeling creation is also an interesting subject. Uh, 
using the query I demonstrated on the JavaScript and, and, and uh, uh, experience uh, column in the stack of the data, for example. In terms of domain-specific collaborations, we are already helping data journalists search uh, census data to direct field uh, journalism. And we work with uh, mental health experts to improve uh, mental health questionnaires based on empirical data. Um, the reason here being is if you want to really diagnose a patient with mental health issues, um, what you had in theory to do is uh, you know, expose them to 10, 20 questionnaires, meaning you have to ask them a thousand questions and that never really works. So they, we, they want us to look at their data and understand sort of you know, what are the questions they should really ask? Where are the predictive relationships in terms of statistics speaking? So thank you. On our webpage, one more thing. On our webpage, there's a sign up form. If you want to reach out about collaborating and contributing, please do. Uh, yeah, thank you.